Hi, this is Mark Taylor. We're here at the North American Christian Convention talking to uh, several of the people who are making this convention happen this week. And right now we've uh, grabbed John Weiss, who is speaking this evening, Wednesday night at the North American, and uh, he consented to visit with us a little bit just before he gets ready to preach his sermon. John, we're so glad you're here. Now tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on at Southland Christian Church. Everybody knows you, but in case they want a little review about you know, sure. how long you've been there and what's going on there now. Uh, my name is John. I've been at Southland for uh, 13 years now. Actually, this week is my uh, ending my 13th year, start my 14th year next year or next week. And uh, lead pastor there. And it's been a blast and had obviously some challenges, but a lot of good times as well. Mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. So you're, uh, you went multi-site when? Went multi-site uh, four years ago uh, with the launch of a campus in Danville, Kentucky, more of a regional model, small town. Uh, bought an old Lowe's building, uh, retrofitted it, and uh, it was a great uh, first campus for us in terms of getting our feet under us and learning about that. And then this past January, we launched a campus back in Lexington, our second campus there, and a uh, little bit different scale, scope, size, but uh, similar success, and learning a lot about it as well. And in the future, looking more at the regional model, towns around central Kentucky. Okay, okay. And so what's happened there during these years? Tell us a little bit about sure. how the church is different today than it was when you got there. Okay. We know it is. Yeah, a lot of transitions. Uh, probably the biggest one would be the multi-site transition uh, for us. Uh, second transition would be moving more towards what most people know as the missional model. Mm-hmm. Uh, limited programming internally within the church on all levels. Most of our uh, efforts are outside the four walls, uh, aimed at the community, uh, specifically aimed at the poor. Southland's always had a heart for people. That's not changed. Um, but in terms of, of where we resource things, staff, money, building usage, most of it now is, is external in nature. And how has the church reacted to that? It's been great. I mean, at, at first, as you know, uh, we, we've lost some people over it. A lot of people come to church for different reasons, and I don't have an issue with that at all. Uh, but a lot of those folks that wanted more programming for them or for their kids obviously left early on. But the growth that we've experienced on the back end of it was well worth uh, the decision making that we went through and uh, would definitely do it again. So there's, uh, let's talk a little bit more about missional. There's a lot of folks out there talking about missional, sure. thinking about going missional. Um, let's, let's look at this from a couple of different angles. First of all, what have you learned about going missional that would have helped you a lot if you'd have known it before you started going down that path? <laughs> That's a good question. I, I probably, you know, when we got into it, we it's all based on Jesus' statement of I, I didn't come to be served but to serve and to give my life away. And the idea that God came in flesh and we want to go to people in flesh instead of expecting them to come to us. And so the movement is obviously sending people out, equipping them and sending them out. Uh, I think we would have done it sooner. I think that's the thing we've learned is uh, the excitement that it creates in people, the fact that it's a, it's a discipleship tool, uh, because once people serve their faith, not only sticks, it grows. And uh, I, I think we would have done it sooner, knowing that, especially with students. Our kids are so excited about serving. And that mindset, we don't have to convince them that that's a natural part of following Jesus. They're just mm-hmm. in, inherently now know, wow, I wake up and my life is to be given away for the good of someone else and for the glory of God. And I think we would have made the transition a whole lot sooner. Do you think it's a generational thing? Are younger people generally, by virtue of our culture or their age or whatever? I, I would say yes and no. I'd say there's an activist kind of mindset in the, the generation coming up. Uh, but what we see at Southland, we're a multi-generational church, young and old alike. And if anything, it's re-energized uh, the older generation in our church towards serving others and, and giving them more reason to be evangelistic, giving them more opportunity to be evangelistic because they're now out and about. Whereas a lot of them, you know, as you know, a lot of, a lot of groups can become very internally focused and ingrown, little holy huddles. And we've challenged every generation within our church to, to be focused on others and to be Jesus wherever God has them during the course of the day. And so, yes and no, I would say it's a multi-generational approach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because the command to serve people isn't limited to one generation. No. Uh, you know, we, we're all challenged and called by God to wash feet. And uh, I, I think everybody, once they do that, they find it's the most fulfilling way to live. 
you think there's something in our culture that's made this more possible today than maybe when you were a kid growing up or when I was a kid growing up or something like that? Have you thought about that? Y yes. Um, now, for me, I, I grew up in a church environment where this was part of what we did. So my whole life, this is all I've known. I attended traditional churches at times where the focus was more internal, the programs were more internal. Um, but I always saw that as pretty pretty boring and stale. So I don't know if it's a cultural variant as much as it is a movement of the Spirit mm. and a reclamation of a simple biblical truth about the Missio Dei, the mission of God. Mm -hmm. so. so you're preaching this evening at the, here at the North American yes, Christian exactly. Convention. How many times have you preached to the North American? It's my third time. Your third time. Your topic tonight is suffering? Endure suffering patiently from Revelation 6 and 7. So, uh, what? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Matt Proctor, what, by the way. Let me what, tell about, you that. what about being senior minister at, at Southland has equipped you for this sermon, that oh. topic? No, I'm just, that's a joke. Right? No, that's great. That's a joke. I would just say, you know, the common language of the church is suffering. And I think when we preach to pain, we never lack for a congregation. Most people in our culture today are struggling. And when you talk about pain and it becomes the language of your church, you're going to have a lot of people show up, mm -hmm. whether that's depression, suicide, marriage challenges, financial woes. Mm -hmm. Our culture right now is calibrated towards suffering because of the enemy. And I think it's a, it's a very relevant topic for the church to address. And creating a Me Too culture where the world understands that Christians aren't exempt from suffering. I think the health, wealth, theology of our day has done a lot of damage uh, to the real truth of specifically Revelation 6. That Christians aren't exempt from the suffering. It's actually an expectation. Jesus said you're going to have problems in this world. And for the, for the world to see that, hey, we're in this as well, I think that's the new language of the church. And so you said the, we're calibrated for suffering because of the enemy. By that you mean uh, because of just everything that's happening in the world because of the, the devil's work. Absolutely. I think sin is, is obviously his work, and the consequence of sin is suffering. And I contribute to it, you contribute to it, we all contribute to the suffering in our world. And uh, his goal is to, as Jesus said, to seek, kill, and destroy. And I, to me, that's a, that's a definition of what suffering looks like. So you're going to talk more about suffering in general than suffering for being a Christian. Sure. I, I think there are two things to talk about tonight in the message. Is one is what happens when we suffer and then our perspective as Christians in the midst of suffering. There's no way to deny the kind of the global undercurrent of Revelation 6. It's not just limited to the Americans' understanding of pain and suffering, but it's, it's very global in nature. And so I'm going to look at it from that angle. Because mm -hmm. uh, most American Christians don't have an experience suffering for being a Christian. That's true. That's true. And, you know, the, the primary part of Revelation 6 is those who have laid their lives down on the altar of God, the martyrs. And they cry out from the altar, how long, sovereign Lord, will we suffer? And so that is a, that is a persecution passage for sure. So the best way for the Christian to cope with suffer, suffering is to anticipate it? Anticipate it and recognize that it's temporary. Mm. It's not permanent. One of the works, I think, psychologically of the enemy that I won't talk about tonight is that he tries to convince us that it won't end. And, or that our suffering is worse than the next person. The pity party or the self-centeredness that suffering can create is detrimental to us and to the community of Christ mm -hmm. and our message that we're victorious and that the suffering will end. He will wipe every tear from every eye. Looking forward to your sermon, John. Thanks, Thanks Mark. so much for being willing to talk with us about a little bit Thanks this for afternoon. Having me. Yeah.